1974, Michael Thompson and the Miami Jackson High School basketball team with a 33-0 record became the Florida State champions. In 1978, he was the first foreign-born player to become a number one draft pick in NBA history. In 1987 and 1988, with back-to-back -back championships, he became a two-time NBA champion with the Los Angeles Lakers, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Thompson! Michael George Thompson was born in Nassau, Bahamas on January 30th, 1955. His parents, DeWitt and Marriott, had seven children, four boys and three girls. Michael was the sixth child. It was a home that was filled with love and happiness, and even at a very early age, Michael understood the importance of family and proved that he was not afraid to step out into the unknown. And I remember one time my sister Cherry left her pencils at home, forgot to take them to school, and I remember to this day, I was three years old at the time, and I remember leaving, walking out of the house not knowing where I was going to take her, her pencils to school. And I got lost going down toward, towards like Centerville in that area. And uh, I remember walking on the side of the street at three years of age, wasn't crying. I was just going to look for a school to take her pencils to her. And my father was in a panic. And he finally, he eventually found me walking on the side of the road. From a little boy, nothing upset Michael. Couldn't get him upset. You know, you talk to him. Okay, you, you finished? Okay, good. We still friends. That's the way Michael was, and, and still is to this day. Very loving, very warm, you know, very caring too. We are very competitive. He's four years older. I'm, you know, obviously, I'm going to be smaller. I'm not going to be as fast. And we competed with every, about everything, with everything, whether it's marbles, whether it was who could run around the yard the fastest, who could throw the ball the furthest. So we were constantly in competition with each other. At least I thought I was competing because I was so much younger. But every time he would win, because he's bigger and older, and he would tease me and call me names, and that just drove me crazy. The Thompson household was also steeped in religious principles, with a strict father at the helm, guiding them, teaching them. Five o'clock in the afternoon, we gotta be in our pajamas, sitting, and while our friends are outside playing rounders, or playing bruising, playing kick the can, and, and it's getting a little dark, and here we are in our pajamas, sitting on the wall, or sitting on the porch watching our friends having all this fun outside, but we can't go outside because it's already five o'clock, we gotta get ready for bed or get ready for supper. So my father was very strict in those days and what he said, uh, he ruled with an iron hand, an iron fist. One Sunday, he's dead and gone now, George Lunn, he was an elder in Grace Church. So he's down there watching the ball game and he goes and tells daddy, say to wit, boy, Colin could play. Daddy say, play what? They say, man, he'd be out there Sunday. In those days, you know, there were very few cars, so you, when you, you, know, you could spot them a mile away. And Dad had this two-tone Pontiac green. And boy, I'm up on the fort, my bicycle against the wall, and I see this car coming up the hill. I believe I was home before Daddy got home <laughs> in this car. My dad was an elder in the church, so, you know, whatever happened in the church basically was transferred to the family. So we grew up with a very, uh, shall I say, regimented approach to Bible study, Sunday school, uh, prayer meetings, uh, daily devotionals that was very, I, I, it's very impactful in our lives. And I, we came to know the Lord as a, at, at, a, at an early age. And I think that helped ground us in terms of being confident when we got out into the world certain paths that we didn't want to go down, even though sometimes you kind of you strayed a little bit. But Michael and I and, um, and, all the, and all the brothers and sisters in our household basically were brought up to believe that you put God first, family second, and you work hard and things are going to work out for you because God will bless you. You know, when I was growing up, when I was 9, 10, 12 years of age, I was more into, uh, you know, baseball, following baseball. The Los Angeles Dodgers were my team growing up as I was, when I was a kid. So I always thought I was going to be either a pilot or a baseball player, because those are my two first loves, planes and uh, playing baseball. And I really didn't play any organized sports and like in baseball or anything, because there wasn't anything. 
so I didn't really start uh, getting into sports heavily and thinking that that's something I really wanted to do until I became more uh, 15, 16 years of age. When I was 9 to 12 years of age, I just wanted to go to the, to the beach up to Fort Montague and go swimming. I just wanted to go down to Potiski and dive off the boats or just to hang out around the neighborhood with my friends. I wasn't really thinking about I like sports, but I really wasn't thinking about it, uh, doing it as on a team or in any team. I just liked sports, but I didn't want to play for anybody. Michael grew up in the perfect environment, when you think about it. It's kind of weird because his parents loved him. He had an older brother in Colin who was very competitive. Colin was a great baseball player in his day. Colin actually played basketball. He played all the sports. So Colin pushed Michael to become more competitive. We didn't know at the time that he was going to use that competitive drive and focus it on basketball. The seed was planted early as Michael was introduced to the game of basketball. It is not surprising that it all began at church. I played for Central Gospel Chapel when I was about 15 years of age. And that's really the first time I ever played organized basketball because my brother Colin made me play. I was about six foot four, six foot three at the time, starting to really stretch out. And Colin said, boy, as big as you are, uh, you're going to play some basketball for us. So I had no choice but to play for our church team, and that's the first time I started playing. Michael never knew nothing but basketball. But when he started playing, it was ridiculous what he did in the church league. He blocked about 30 shots one night. Seriously, no kidding. Nobody would even come near the rim. <laughs> you know, We were laughing so much. It was unbelievable. It's just that... He was gifted by God. That's all we could put it to. Because we never taught him how to play any games. Like I said, he only started playing in the church league. And Mike, a little bit of coaching, you know, hey, go score as much as you could. <laughs> they asked me to come up by Garfunkel Auditorium. And I came up this night, and there was this tall, skinny guy, really. And I knew it was Mike, right? And they started the game. And let me tell you, he blocked everything that came his way. I mean, you, the only way you could score or try to get a shot off was to shoot from the field. If you tried to come inside, he just pinned the ball to, to the backboard. And it was just incredible. And I knew even then, from that early point, that he had this awesome talent to connect his hands with the ball. Michael managed to create quite a name for himself locally, but he never gave any thought to playing professional basketball. His brother Colin, however, quickly realized the natural gift that Michael possessed and did not hesitate to tell his friends about his talented little brother. One of Colin's friends, who had heard all about Michael's basketball skills, was Godfrey Enius. I went to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And uh, Jake and I entered Tuskegee at the same time. So when we graduated, I came home and he went to Miami to teach. So one Sunday, I was playing baseball and he came by the park. He said, uh, I'm looking for a Thompson. I said, Thompson, a basketball player. I said, well, Jake, the only Thompson I know is Colin Thompson's brother. Colin Thompson played first base with us. And he was always talking about his little brother who uh, was a big star in the church league. So I took him to the Thompson house and he found out it was the wrong Thompson. It was Charles Thompson. You know, and, 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 and so when he saw Michael and they had this basketball rim in the yard. And so when Jake saw that, so immediately his, his interest were peaked, you know, and, and so when he saw Michael, saw how big he was. And, uh, and so he said, you got to come to Miami. I've coached a number of very successful boys uh, who played major college and pro basketball. So the, the, the key thing is that they were tall. And uh, the rest of the, of the, when you get into the program, uh, we can teach them to play. And uh, it took a while, but uh, the results are evident. <laughs> and that's the story. And that's how it all, that's how it all, all began. So I take the claim that I discovered Michael. <laughs> I will never forget Godfrey Aeneas as long as I live. And our family is grateful to him to, to think that much of Michael to bring someone there 
who really wasn't looking for Michael. And, you know, to be blessed in that way, it was God's doing. That's what we said. Yes. Because of Godfrey bringing the coach by and for, for calling to stay on my father, because my father wasn't going to let me go, you know, because no child of his had really gone off to school yet. So this is, this is something strange and foreign to the, to the other Bahamian parents at the time. Now it's kind of like a normal thing. But back then, 45 years ago, uh, that was something that uh, parents just didn't think of. And, but Colin had to talk him into uh, let me go and enroll in Miami Jackson High School as a junior. So thank goodness for Colin's uh, persistence. In 1971, Neville Copey Conyers left the Bahamas to play basketball at Miami Jackson High School in Miami, Florida. In 72, Jake, like they made a team, didn't start, made a team. But Tiny Pender and uh, Big Mac, they were playing the Northwest and beating everybody up. Then you had a guy named Carter Lightburn at uh, Carroll City, Bohemian. So who said, man, you can't, all these good Bohemian players in uh, in Miami, you can't find some other baby players to bring over. I said, man, I got a crew them, let's go. So we packed up, we came to Nassau. The coach called me and said, Mrs. Taylor, is it more like him? The boy plays good basketball? I said, yeah, man. I said, we have more over here like him. I said, bring him back and let's do an exhibition game for you. So he did that. Um, Osworth Pistock helped me to pull the group together. So we had Cecil Rose, we had Charles Thompson, we had Michael Thompson, um, Neville Conyers, I think they call him Colby Conyers, Ghost and Bane. They all came together, it was six of them, that's 6A. And they played a, um, an exhibition game for him, he said, I'll take them all back. So he took them back to Miami Jackson and the rest is history. I think that was the best time in the whole history of that school that they came out winners. Between 1971 and 1972, Osborne Goose Lockhart, Charles Thompson, Cecil Rose, and Michael Thompson were also recruited by Miami Jackson High School. As the young men began to settle into life in Florida, their basketball team, the Miami Jackson Generals, was becoming a serious force to contend with. The first couple of months I was in Miami as a junior, 17 years old, I was so homesick I just wanted to go home. I was missing my mother's cooking. I was missing the lifestyle in the Bahamas, the easygoing lifestyle. Miami to me, it's only right across, you know, it's 40 minutes away, but it still felt like it was, I was living on Mars. Pace of life was so much faster. The kids were different. Everything was different. Uh, living in a little one room house where I was living at the time, and I, was, I, I missed my home, I missed my bedroom, all that stuff. So I was really ready to just quit and go home, but something just kept telling me to stick with it. And, and plus having, Osborne and Cecil and Charles there, four, three other Bahamians there with me, made the transition a lot easier. There were times when I uh, strongly considered going back home. Um, it, it, was, it was different and difficult. Um, uh, the culture itself, you know, uh, even there was subtle racism even against Bahamians at that point, you know. Um, but because of the sports, we were well received. It was a different culture, it was faster, it was a little bit more dangerous than we was used to. You know, we heard more cuss words than we were used to hearing, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the kids were just different. Um, when I chewed my chicken bones, they laughed at me and that was normal for me to do at home, stuff like that. But it, it was really challenging in a way that, you know, we were just young men, not knowing what was going on, not realizing what impact we were having. We owe um, all of our achievements, I think, to, to um, Coach. Um, he set the, the, the foundation for all of us, uh, the fundamentals. He gave us the fundamentals and the necessary things to, to, um, to be able to keep improving and to, uh, he instilled in us uh, right from the beginning that it's not easy, you, you have to work hard. He was very demanding, but he treated us with a lot of respect. He didn't abuse us verbally. You know, he uh, made us, he expects us to work hard and pushed us to be as good as we could be. But it was, uh, it was very interesting playing for him because he commanded respect. And uh, like I said, he, he really taught us a lot, taught us how to be men. 
He taught us the right way to play the game. So I have a lot to, to be thankful to him for because, uh, and he made you pay attention because he knew he was a no-nonsense guy. You could tell he, he has, I think he's got some Bahamian blood in him because he's very strict and very demanding. And uh, we respected that uh, in him as a coach. My basketball program was a program of teaching, teaching program. We taught kids who could not play how to play. And uh, that's a skill, and uh, it's, it's, it's something that if the kid is willing to work hard, become dedicated, put the time in, as I said before, and have the discipline, we can teach him to play. And that's what happened with Michael. That happened with Charlie. And they became outstanding players. Osborne, same way. Uh, the deal is, is that most kids don't want to pay the price that it takes to do that. That means you have to be in the gym, you have to be, be working on your skills, you have to be, be amenable to coaching, you have to be able to accept what's going on, understand it, and try to translate it into your particular game. The four Bahamians, along with Cuban-American Julio Davila, were now the starting five, and the team became known as the Jackson Five. The Miami Jackson Generals were demolishing teams, winning game after game. In 1974, the Miami Jackson Generals, led by the Jackson Five, went on to win the state championship with a record of 33-0. To have a, a national championship team at 33 and 0 and not undefeated is is no joking and no no joking matter. It requires a substantial amount of dedication and time and effort to do that. That was really a fun time because um, is there's been some games the the score was so lopsided that we only played maybe a half of the game, you know, so it was fun. It was exciting. I mean, because of the way people treated us, particularly here and then even when we went home, you know, we, we started to be special. I mean, when we came home, people knew we were home and they wanted us to do interviews. And even when we went to church, they recognized that we were home. And it, it, it was, you know what? I enjoyed it. I, now that I think back on it, it was really, it was really awesome. It was really a good experience. They um, set records. They brought in crowds. Uh, you, you would have thought it was a professional, the NBA team or the Dolphins playing uh, in the stadium. When the Jackson Generals were playing, I mean, people lined the streets. They went to see these guys. That's how phenomenal they were. We still talk about that today, even in our old age. We talk about how special those times were and how cool it was to have everybody in the Bahamas watching us and seeing what we were. We were starting to put the Bahamas on the map through uh, sports, helping them do that anyway. And now the people back there were, were following our, our career. The victory was not celebrated by everyone though. And soon there were newspaper articles in circulation attempting to discredit and disqualify the team. It was a lot of innuendo that uh, Cecil Rose had two birth certificates. Well, I, I can't deal with that. I, I'm not in Nassau. I only know that the information and the, the passport, which at that time was a British passport, not a Bahamian passport, because Bahamas at that time was not an independent country, uh, was issued to him, and that's what we go on here. We can't go back and do with other things in the Bahamas. So uh, it appeared that maybe his age was uh, falsely uh, moved up in the Bahamas to let him play on the police team. And that's what ended up coming out of that. With this very impressive championship now under their belts, it was now time for the Fantastic Four to take their basketball skills to the next level. Cecil and Charles went on to the University of Houston, while Osborne and Michael went to the University of Minnesota to play for the Gophers. It was not long before Michael, who earned the name Sweet Bells because of the tassels he wore on his tennis shoes, again began to make the headlines. I could have left after my freshman year one of the teams in the ABA, the American Basketball Association, which was a, which was a rival to the NBA at the time. Uh, my coach, Bill Musselman, left Minnesota to go take a job in the ABA, and he took one of my teammates with him, Mark Oberding, and he asked me to go along with him too. After my freshman, it turned pro. 
And at the time, he offered me, now get this, this was 1975, he offered me $180,000 a year. Now people had a figure today in pro sports, they go, oh, that's no money. But $180,000 a year, that was huge money back then. I think gas in the Bahamas at that time was maybe like 50 cents a gallon, you know, back in those times. That's how relative it was, so $180,000 a year was big money. But I just didn't feel like I was ready mentally to leave college to go to start working for a living. So I, was, I turned it down to go back to school. The team that we were on um, and is still considered to be the, the, the best team that the University of Minnesota ever had. I really watched Mike develop into a dominant player. With him and Kevin McHale, it was a one-two punch. And plus he had um, guys like myself and Ray Williams that were on the outside that, that gave them the opportunity not to uh, be able to get double teamed so they were able to operate one-on-one -on -one because of the great players around him. I thought to a great de degree he revolutionized the center position um, in college um, because he was one of the few big men who I've ever seen been able to just drift, drift back and can the 15, 12 foot shot with regularity. Centers were uh, used primarily and, and the expectation was them to just um, command the pivot, you know, control the pivot on defense, make sure nobody gets in or pull down rebounds on offense and kick it out to one of the other players. But he was able, he was like a double dimension. He played the great defense and he was also a tremendous offensive threat. While he did try to fit in with the university scene, Michael says that his Christian upbringing always kept him on the straight and narrow road. The temptations are there, no question about it. The party and the wild parties and stuff. But uh, just, I don't like crowds. Maybe that's part of, part of it. I just don't like being in a crowded place with a lot of noise. So uh, I was never really tempted to be a wild partier because my parents brought us up to really uh, conduct yourself in a godly manner and not to go out there and do too many crazy worldly things that uh, you'll be ashamed of or they'll make you ashamed of in God's eyes, in the sight of God. So we are, those type of uh, teachings always stuck with us. Michael is like Barack Obama. You're not gonna get him into anything because he just has no interest. I remember when I'd go up to Minnesota, uh, we'd go to parties, he, myself, and Goose, and Michael would take a soft drink and stand up against the wall throughout the party. Goose and I would mingle, interact. He'd just stand up, you know, just smiling and just watching the action, and that would be him. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Michael to this day remains the most dominant player in the University of Minnesota's basketball history. In 1977, the 6'10 standout center earned a place on the NCAA All-American first team. In 1977, against Marquette in Milwaukee, where Marquette is uh, located, went to their school, went to their, their, their arena, and my Minnesota team with Osborne Lockhart Ray Williams, who played for the New York Knicks for a lot of years, and Flip Saunders, who coached in the NBA for many years, and Kevin McHale, who all basketball fans know he is, of course, Hall of Famer for the Boston Celtics. We went to Marquette University that season on their floor and whooped them. And that was the year that Marquette won the national championship. And I'll never forget it to this day, after Marquette won the national championship, Al McGuire, their coach, came on the TV or came on the microphone and said, you know what, we won a national championship but the best team in the country is Minnesota. And people say, well, why didn't Minnesota win the title then? Well, that year we were on probation. We weren't allowed to play in the NCAA tournament, not because of any rules that we had broken. Guys who had been in Minnesota before us broke some rules that prevented us. People got put on probation, prevent us from going to the NCAA tournament. But that 1977 team we had was the best team in the country, no doubt in my mind, and going to Marquette and beating the national championship, championship team on their floor, that stands out to me. In 1978, Michael also broke the school's all-time scoring record with 1,992 points. While his mom watched proudly from the sidelines, he made his way to her and presented her with the ball. Michael says it was around this time that his feelings started to change. He was now at least entertaining the possibility of an NBA career.
It was different back then than it is today. With social media and so much attention now focused on these young players in college, they know about their draft status or their professional status before they even enroll in college. Oh, you're going to be a pro in one year because they have all these scouting reports they can look up on the internet and read about themselves. I didn't really think about it until somebody brought it up. So, but uh, by the time you're a senior and you get all these accolades as you're going through these ju sophomore and junior year, you start thinking along the lines, okay, maybe I can play, be a pro next year. I knew that he was the best player in my mind. But of course, you know, with the politics and him being a foreigner, I, wasn't, I knew he would be an easy first rounder. I was hoping that he would be in the top five, but I wasn't really certain that he would be number one. Even though he was very dominant in college, at that time as Bahamians, we still weren't thinking NBA because no one had ever achieved that. It's such a foreign concept when you go from leaving Nassau to high school in Miami, then you go to university, and because he was a pioneer almost every step of the way, you can't look back and go, wow, he's following the same footsteps of another player who went to the NBA. So this was all brand new for us. So even though he was getting all these accolades in college, you really didn't know. You really didn't know until, I think, in his senior year, when you started hearing the projections of who might be number one, who they think is going to be, you know, the top two or three picks. That's when you kind of realize, wow, he really has a chance to go to the, the NBA. But it's so funny, looking back, you think, how could you not see that? But it's easier when you're looking back, but in the moment, as a family, we were so naive, just like everybody else, that Michael was going to the NBA. And not only was he going to go to the NBA, but he had the potential to be the number one pick. The Portland Trailblazers have selected Michael Thompson from the University of Minnesota with the first pick in the 1978 NBA draft. NBA history was made today when Thompson became the first foreign-born player to be selected with the number one pick. Now, it wasn't as big a production back then in 78 as it is today. Today, it's like the Academy Awards, major TV production. And they fly the kids in and they treat them like kings for a week. It's just uh, back then, I got drafted number one. I was called into New York, basically sitting in a room like this. It was me, myself, my parents, my sister Pat, and the commissioner of the NBA and maybe one handheld camera. And that's all. They said, Michael, you were drafted number one. Congratulations, and let's go get something to eat. And that's basically, that's what it was. It still, it was, a, it was an honor to be taken, flown into New York, so they could announce me as the number one pick in the draft. When he was drafted um, number one in 78, a um, uh, few people could argue that he was the best player in college at the time, and that's phenomenal. You mean, can you imagine a Bahamian being the best college player? That's phenomenal. I don't think he's gotten um, enough credit for it. I mean, we, we, we um, talked about it at the time, but I think generally as years um, went by, people kind of took it for granted. But for a Bahamian to be drafted number one in the NBA, that is awesome and is something that uh, I think would be the highlight of his legacy for years to come. Do you realize how incredible that was? To be the first player overall to be picked in the NBA? and for a person that, that started to play basketball as a teenager, he didn't learn it, he learned the game late. So it just goes to show you um, the, the dedication and the hard work he put in. That year, Osborne Lockhart was drafted by Philadelphia 76ers, Cecil was drafted by New Jersey Nets, and, and Charles Thompson was drafted by Phoenix Suns. So that was the, the first set of Bahamians. Again, this is something tremendous to have four kids from a small country drafted to the NBA. And not only that, to have Michael being the number one pick, player taken, that was uh, unprecedented. Obviously, it has happened since when Akeem Elijah when came along and Tim Duncan and those guys. But that was very special. But uh, fast forward four years later, Michael was still uh, with uh, Portland. I was drafted by the Lakers. And so, you know, that was obviously, again, we all, Andy, myself, and all the other kids, we all wanted to be what the, the Bahamian Four was. We wanted to be successful, and we did. Here I am at 23 years of age now, whoa, I'm, sitting, I'm standing next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, little island boy from Nassau. I'm on the same corporate Kareem. 
I'm on the same court with, uh, with Moses Malone, um, Bob Lanier, all these Hall of Famers that I grew up admiring and reading about. So it was a whole different experience being on the court against my basically basketball idols. Guys I used to read every week, wait till the magazines come out and so I can grab those magazines and read about these great sports legends. And to be on the same court with them, I felt like, obviously I'm not as good as them, but I felt like I finally had arrived and I'm playing at the, the pinnacle of basketball. Micah was an incredible player. He's one of those guys that could get you 20 and 10 every single night. He was a big guy who could really pass the ball, very intelligent, a great defender. Um, uh, Michael was worthy of being the number one pick. If he was coming out today, he'd be a number one pick. Just an incredible basketball player, a real talent, but he was a super nice guy. And so when I got there, he took me in like a little brother, uh, showed me the city of Portland, uh, taught me the plays. I mean, we had a million plays at that time on the team. And uh, he kind of took me in. We had dinner. I stayed at his house for a while. Uh, he, he's always been a great friend. Back in 2003, when in, uh, LeBron was a rookie, Sports Center led with LeBron James' phenomenal debut in the last two games. He scored 57 points. But the record is held by, you know, former trailblazer and Laker Michael Thompson, who scored 60 points in his first two games. And I went, what? Wow. I didn't know Michael held an NBA record. And no one's ever done it. When you think about the Magics and the Jordans and the Akeems and, and the, you know, birds, that Michael holds that record, eh, that's, that's pretty cool. It's a nice record to hold. I had big feet. I think I was size 13. I was probably 12 years old, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere in there. And uh, my dad took me to Michael Thompson's uh, shoe store. The more I, I did my uh, research on who this person was that got to wear cool tennis shoes, uh, to fit his feet instead of construction boots, I came to find out that he, he had been drafted by the Portland Trail Blazers, that he was a basketball player, that he played in the NBA, and, and my curiosity for the NBA took off. My uh, curiosity for someone that lived in my neighborhood that had uh, gone off to high school and made it to college and got a, uh, drafted in the NBA you know, gave me an idea that there was something out there great and exciting and fun that I could do. Uh, and therefore, I, I adopted the same uh, dream he had for himself. It, I, it became a dream of mine. Everywhere he, we went, we traveled on the plane and stuff, Michael would always have his Bible with him. He's a devout Christian. And so he'd be have his Bible looked like a coloring book because he highlighted so much of it. We always used to say, Michael's got his coloring book with him. <laughs> but Michael was a, had a great sense of humor, great one-liners, and I don't think he's got a serious bone in his body. Maybe now since he's gotten older, but boy, when he was young, he was a lot of fun to be around. You got to travel with your Bible. It keeps you, keeps you grounded, keeps you humble, keep, reminds you where your blessings are coming from and uh, while you're on this earth. And uh, all this other stuff that you get, the money from the NBA and the glory and the fame, and uh, that all, that's all great and that's all cool, but you got to keep everything in perspective and realize who it all belongs to and why you have it. He was probably the most popular trailblazer when I got there, and, and we all loved him. I mean, Michael was active in the community, on the board of a lot of charities, helped out in the community. We're talking about a saint. I mean, this guy, anything they needed or wanted Michael to do, he was there. And uh, he's very unselfish, and I think that's the reason he's had so much good luck because he's always willing to give back. Never parted. I don't ever see, remember seeing Michael at a club. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's like a fish out of water. Uh, not that it, you know, he was cool enough. He just did, that wasn't his thing. He just didn't enjoy that. He enjoyed serenity, peace. And uh, Michael's always been very peaceful. That's why he's never gotten in any trouble all of these years. You never heard anything bad about Michael Thompson, ever. And that means he's been a Boy Scout. I mean, he is such a do-gooder, he never does anything bad. That year, Michael made the NBA All-Rookie First Team, and then in the summer of 1979, after playing in the NBA for only one year, Michael returned home for a vacation that he will never forget. I used to come home every summer, and so I can, you know, get some of that uh, peas and rice back in me and crack conk, so I had to come home. And once you come home and eating all that good food, you put on weight. So you got to work out. You got to exercise. 
So we were down there one night just playing around, playing some street ball, rat ball, pickup basketball is what they call it. And uh, I'll never forget it. I was just running down the court to go throw down a dunk. And uh, as I jumped, my leg just snapped. Bone didn't come sticking out or anything like that. Nothing that graphic, but I knew I broke my leg. I could feel it. And I just had kind of a spiral break in my bone. So my bone sort of twisted and, and broke. As with any professional athlete who was injured, the speculation began. Could he still have a successful career in the NBA? Michael said he never doubted himself for one minute. I knew I was going to be OK. A lot of people were praying for me. And I had faith that God had more things for me to do, that my career was going to be over like this. So I never really had any negative thoughts creeping into my mind saying, oh, my, my career is over, or wondering if my career was over. I knew I was going to come back. Cause you know, you hear stories about people breaking bones before, and if they give enough time to heal, they'll, they're fine. They'll come back as good as new. So that's what I always thought. I'll just take the year off and come back the following season and be as good as new. Michael went on to spend eight years with the Portland Trailblazers and says that while making it to the NBA was a great accomplishment, he had one word to sum up his eight years with the Portland Trailblazers. Frustrating, because we couldn't beat the Lakers and Magic Johnson. We were a good team. We had a good team up there, but every time we made the playoffs and we felt like we were ready to do something special, we get knocked off by the Los Angeles Lakers. So it's frustrating, but I was thankful I had eight years there. Loved every minute of it, but it was still frustrating because I always felt like we didn't achieve our full potential because we were good, but we just couldn't get past those Lakers. The Lakers were just too good for us. I always felt that. And the one disappointment I had um, with him in Portland was that um, he was in position in the center position throughout his career in Portland. Uh, I think had that been the case, uh, he would have put up statistics and would have played um, to the point where he would have been um, considered for Hall of Fame status. I really do. <laughs> now let's hold it down out there in the studio audience, please. But I'm Michael Thompson. Uh, so I'm still with the Portland Trailblazers, am I, uh, as far as I know, last time I checked anyway. In the summer of 1986, Michael was traded to the San Antonio Spurs. It was a move that only lasted four and a half months and would take Michael to the doorstep of the team that he had always dreamed of being a part of. I enjoyed my four and a half months there. Even though I was there, I didn't want to get traded there, but I figured, okay, I'll make the most of it. It's a nice city, nice people, I like my teammates, but we weren't gonna win a championship there. So I, so I was resigned to the fact that, okay, if I have to spend the rest of my career here in San Antonio, I'll adjust and get used to it. Michael was completely unaware that the Los Angeles Lakers were trying to acquire him. It seems that he was the last one to find out. I was in San Antonio at the time. I was taking a nap the moment I got traded. My phone was off the hook, so no one could call me. Because remember, no cell phones back then. That's how long ago this was. And uh, I took my phone off the hook when I got traded, so I had no idea that I had just been traded. I woke up, uh, got ready to go to the arena because we had a game that night in San Antonio. When I got to the arena, uh, I was like one of the first to arrive in the locker room and the trainer for the Spurs was there and he was surprised to see me walk in. He goes, you know, what are you doing here? I said, we got a game tonight. What do you mean, I'm, what am I doing here? He said, well, we just traded your bleepity bleep to the Lakers. I said, yeah, right. And I just went to my locker and sat down thinking, you know, where's my uniform? I want to get ready to play the game tonight. And uh, he says, no, I'm serious. You're not a spur anymore. Get the bleep out of here. You know, he's goofing around with me because he was a kidder. So I thought he was just kidding around. He says, Michael, we traded you to the Lakers. He tried to convince me. I said, yeah, right. Just give me my uniform so I can get dressed. And then finally, the general manager came and says, no, Michael, we really did trade you to the Lakers. And I don't even remember nothing. I think I went home and packed. After that, I think I was floating. I don't even remember touching the ground after that. I, I got home some kind of how. In 1987, uh, Jerry West called me on the telephone and he said, uh, I have a real surprise for you. Uh, we have acquired, you know, Michael Thompson uh, you know, for the rights of uh, a certain player. Uh, I said, what? I said, we're going to have Michael Thompson also to go with Kareem and Magic and Scott and Worthy and Cooper and, you know, and all of a sudden we got a backup center that's going to be able to, to do that. And so, um, that's what I felt. I felt because I, I, I had so much respect for, for Michael and his game and how he conducted himself and how he conditioned himself, his attitude uh, as a player. Uh, I remember the first meeting that I had with him and he got traded. He came to Los Angeles 
this was a Saturday morning. Uh, we're playing the Boston Celtics on national television on Sunday. And so he had like a half a day. And, uh, and I said, well, we need to get you up to speed, get you our plays and our defenses. And he says, I don't, you don't have to do anything. He says, I know everything. He says, I've memorized all your stuff. I've been playing against you guys for eight years. So I, I know what you do. And so we spent about a half an hour with him. And uh, we put him in the game against the Celtics, you know, on Sunday. And he had like 14 points. We won the game. And, and it's not a, an irony that, or a coincidence, that the three years that Michael was there were the three greatest years that we had. When they inserted me into the lineup and made me part of the team, I just told them, whatever you needed me to do, I was going to do. So that was easy to do. Just basically go out there and don't screw things up. So it was a really easy adjustment to me. Yeah, I had to learn plays, but uh, I take myself seriously as a student of the game. And uh, so it wasn't hard to learn the plays right off. Because, you know, if you pay attention, you can catch on very quickly. And uh, they were an easy team to catch on with because their players were so great, they made the transition easy for me because all I had to try to do was just fit in next to Kareem, fit in with Magic and Worthy, AC Green, these guys. So it was a really easy transition for me. So I picked it up. I picked things up very quickly. The previous year, we had lost to the Boston Celtics. Uh, they had a very formidable front line of Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, and Robert Parrish. And although we could match up with them, we still didn't have that player that could really stop McHale. And that's when Jerry West decided to make the move and go get Michael because, again, having watched Michael play against uh, Kevin when he was with Portland, the good job that he always did against him, and he felt that that was the missing piece. Uh, sometimes we thought Michael Thompson was a missing link. Uh, being from Bahamas and all that. But again, he was a crucial piece for us beating the Boston Celtics in 1985 because he did a masterful job on playing Kevin McHale uh, the way that he played him. Wasn't real, I mean, he played physical, but Mike just knew him well from their days in Minnesota. Jabbar was reaching the very end and um, he couldn't play a whole game and be productive as he had been through most of his, um, the early portion of his career. And, and Michael was the perfect person, somebody who could play the, um, the center position excellently and who could score, and, but who would play within his role because you know you had the Michael Kubas, you know you had the James Worthy, and of course you had Magic, you know you had Byron, you know, so Byron Scott. And of course, there was your boss. So I mean, you had to have a tremendous presence of mind to know what your role was. And I see it again. If he was not humble, you know, he would have gone and in and, and tried to be a star. But the moments that the coaches put him in there, they were valuable moments for the team. He always played exactly within his role. You know, if he needed to make a shot, you know, he would get two opportunities or three opportunities to make a shot. He would can them. You know what I mean? For the most part, but he would play D you know, strong defense in the pivot position. So he really complemented the Lakers um, tremendously, and he was perfect for the moments when they had to give Jabbar a rest. They know they could bring him in and they wouldn't lose anything. And when you got 12 players on the team, there's 12 distinct personalities, and he has some big egos, <laughs> you know, you got, and they have to be maintained in, in a special way. And you got some other guy that has to be treated differently in another way. He said, look, you have to worry about me. He said, you don't have to maintain me. You don't have to pat me on the back. You don't have to yell at me. You don't have to give me advice. He says, I'll be there every single day for you. And, but if you want to do all those things, then you're just wasting your time. I think that guy needs it, and I think that guy needs it, and that guy needs it, and I'll help you with those guys. And so he just knew, you know, after all those years of being in the NBA, what it was to be a professional and how to be part of a team, and not only uh, to be a productive player, but to be an ally. Mike wasn't one to try to impose his religious beliefs on, on the team, but he knew that we were a religious group. And again, I think the one thing that became very clear is that early in our, uh, when we were going through uh, those championship years, is that we had um, uh, like a Bible study class before. And Michael was instrumental along with A.C. Green of making that happen for our team. And, you know, every night he said, Coop, come on, we got to go to, you know, Bible study before the game. And all it was was just fellowshipping with other players, fellowshipping about the word. Uh, and because we're all after the same goal. I mean, we all pray to the same God of us winning a championship. Uh, but I just believe that we had the better uh, talent at that time to outlast many teams. But again, Michael was a big part of making that happen for our team. Uh, the one thing that I didn't like about 
Michael is if a fight broke out, he wasn't about to start fighting. <laughs> he was trying to be the peacemaker all the time. But again, I loved him more for the things that he gave us. Great rebounder, uh, tenacious defensive player on there. And you know what? One of the things that is so overlooked in the game of basketball, especially in the NBA, is the camaraderie and that leadership in the locker room. And Michael's one of the best. He was a very smart man. He's, he's probably one of the smartest players that I ever coached. And so the innate intelligence that he had and how he used that, you know, as, uh, as a player in the game, uh, which made him famous, you know, and made him wealthy, uh, gave him an opportunity to show people in his uh, homeland that you can do it. It was because of Michael's accomplishments gave me hope and it gave me the the assurance that if I had that same dream or if I had the dream of doing anything uh, from my neighborhood that it was going to be possible. And, and I say neighborhood, but as we all know, you know, we, we all live on an island 21 miles by seven, seven miles wide. And so we all are neighbors. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all in support of each other's dreams and, and those dreams not only touching you know, our country and each other in our country, but touching the world. And Mike was one of the first people in my life uh, that I looked up to that was leaving an imprint, not only on the community where he's from, but also on the world. The Los Angeles Lakers now had four number one draft picks on the team. James Worthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Irvin Magic Johnson, and Michael Thompson. This hasn't happened again in the NBA since that season. Now the Lakers seem destined for the championship. And that's exactly what happened. In 1987, the Los Angeles Lakers won the championship after defeating the Boston Celtics in a 4-2 victory. With champagne flowing in the locker room, Michael gave interview after interview, waving his Bahamian flag. I saw him the next day as we were getting ready to go to the parade, make preparations for our championship parade. I said, well, what'd you do last night? And I went home and had some dinner and celebrated a little bit with my wife. And then got up at 7 a.m. in the morning and went into the weight room to work out. So he already got his workout. He said, I had to get my workout in before this long parade we're going to have today. You know, so he's just, he was an amazing player and a better person. And you know where that came from? You know, obviously a great, you know, discipline and a great background. Michael came home to the Bahamas to a hero's welcome and a parade through the streets of Nassau. We're approaching Blake Road right now and a lot of and this has really been a tremendous warm welcome for the Heyman hero of basketball in the country, Michael Thompson. All kind of people are down here watching Michael Thompson come to town. I felt like Neil Armstrong when he came back from the moon. <laughs> to come back and to get that kind of welcome. I was just so proud and so thankful and honored that the Bahamas came out to honor me that way. And, and I was just so proud to be a part of the Bahamas and be one of the first Bahamian to be able to do something like that and to share it with the, the, the country. That's what made it so special. Because when I won the championship, I didn't think of myself. You know, the first thing I thought about was home and everybody back home pulling for the Lakers and saying that they were proud of me and the way I represented the Bahamas. That's what I was most proud of. Michael Thompson is indeed a Bahamian sports hero. And I believe that today he is satisfied that he received a hero's welcome in Nassau. I love you guys. I really appreciate all the support you've given me for the whole nine years. And hopefully we got four more to go. I tell you what, I'll make you a promise. If you promise to do this to me next year at the same time, I promise you the Lakers will repeat as NBA champions. Oh yeah, I already thought we could go back and win it again the following year, as long as everybody stayed healthy. There's no reason why we shouldn't. We stay, we stay healthy and humble, and you have the talent. You can do great things in this uh, world. And I knew that uh, with the fellas coming back and seeing the hunger that Magic and the crew had, no matter how many championships they won, they wanted another one and another one. I saw what kept them on top for so long. They never were satisfied. And I knew going back uh, for 1988 season, these guys were not going to be satisfied with this championship. They're going to want to do it again while they still have the opportunity. In 1988, the Lakers won back-to-back -back championships after defeating the Detroit Pistons in seven games. The Lakers became the first team in 20 years to repeat as champions.
Oh, no question about it. Lakers have always been my team, even when I was with the Blazers. I loved my time there, but I always used to look with uh, envy towards Los Angeles and wish I could play with those guys. It's a great city. It's a, the, I think it's the greatest fr sports franchise in the history of sports. Now, people, Yankees may say something different, or a few soccer clubs over in Europe may think differently, but, and maybe they're right, but the Lakers are definitely in the argument as far as the greatest uh, team franchise around and to be a part of it and uh, to be able to win a championship here. That's something extra special. It's a special fraternity only a few people belong to, and it's an honor to be a part of it. In 1991, after 13 seasons and two NBA championships, Michael retired from the NBA. He then spent one year in Italy before returning to the U.S. So obviously, everybody in this league can play to a certain extent, but they're just a smart team. They just know how to play. Play within themselves, very well coached. There's no big mystery. You guys move the ball. They just play great team basketball on both ends of the floor. It's as simple as that, Laker fans. If you play team ball and play smartly, you're going to win in this league. And the Spurs are one of the greatest in the history of the game at that. You know what that means. Memphis has a lot to play for, though, don't, don't, don't they? Well, they've got the home court advantage with the Clippers. Clippers yeah, so they'll be fired up tomorrow night to make sure they hold on to their home That's court. That's true. That's true. So they should be able to take care of business. You know what happens, though, if Utah wins and the Lakers lose? Oh, I think we are playing golf on Thursday. Since retiring from playing the game of basketball, Michael has gone on to enjoy a successful career in broadcasting. Here at 710, I host a daily talk show with my partner, Mark Willard. And we talk about all subjects, not just Lakers, we talk about all sports. Whatever the hot sports topic is, whether it's the Dodgers or the Los Angeles Angels, whether it's the NFL, some big boxing match or some sports controversy, we, always, we talk about it all. But of course, it all revolves around the Lakers in L.A. No matter what's going on, it always seems to, the Laker talk dominates, even during baseball season. You know, what are the Lakers going to do? Are they going to make any trades? Is Kobe, what's Kobe, how long is Kobe going to play? There's always some Laker topic to speak about here in Los Angeles because that's how much people love it of the Lakers. So, and when I'm not doing that on a daily basis, of course, I'm calling the games for the Lakers on radio. He's a color analyst. And uh, that's a lot of fun. Sticks, keeps me around the game, keeps me young. Gives me a chance to uh, talk to the young guys today about my experiences and try to help them. Michael is the father of three sons, Michael Jr., Clay, and Trace, who are all professional athletes. Well, family is everything, of course. Uh, we're all blessed to have a family. And uh, I'm really blessed to have the family that I have. Three boys, Michael the oldest is 25, Clay is 23, and Trace is 22. Um, Michael, of course, plays basketball too, and I think he'll be in the NBA this season. Clay has a great future ahead of him in Golden State. And uh, Trace is going to be a member of the Chicago White Sox here pretty soon as a center fielder or outfielder, taken after his uncle Colin, who was a big baseball legend in the Bahamas growing up. And it's great to have those three sons. But I tell you, and a lot of people give me credit because I'm in the, sort of like in the public eye, in the limelight because of what I, I do now, and what I did playing basketball. But the reason my boys are successful and the sons that they are is because of their mother, Julie. She's an incredible woman, incredible mother, incredible wife, like most mothers. She uh, was there for those boys. She nurtured them. She took them, drove them around to all their sporting events, all their functions they had to go to. Like most mothers, she fed them, cared for them, loved them, gave them, supported them. And uh, I always tell her she is a great mother. She reminds me of my mother. Michael says that the many successes he has experienced throughout the course of his life are a direct result of his spiritual focus and his relationship with God. He says that he wants to see the youth of the Bahamas enjoy lives beyond their wildest dreams. If ever there was a formula for success, this would have to be it. The main thing I always tell, try to tell the kids when they come home is, you know, have some self-esteem. Believe in yourself. Don't follow the crowd. You know, because we're all going to run into people who sometimes don't want to do the right thing. But you got to have self-respect. You got to think a lot of yourself. You know, set goals and say you want to make, you want to do something special with your life. I know it's going to be hard. Nothing's going to be given to you. You got to work for it. But if you believe in yourself 
and you have self-respect and said, I want to do something positive with my life, even though there could be negative things going on around you with crime and drugs and alcohol, and some kids are going to do the wrong thing. But listen to the people who love you, and that's including coaches and teachers. When the game of professional basketball, both Michael and I, we had to learn to accept that there's days of great wins and there's days of losses. And neither one should define us. They should only inform us of how we play the next game, how we wake up the next day and head out to accomplish our goals and execute on our passions and strive to be excellent every day. This should be a, a, a point of takeoff for uh, somebody to develop the archives that needs to be developed and have these people uh, placed in the archives for the people to know who they are, uh, to, uh, to know their achievements. And uh, therefore, emulation can take place if they know that there's possibilities. The youth of the Bahamas, like any other city, there's always a challenge. I mean, there's right and there's wrong. If you want to be somebody, you got to do the right things. And everyone wants to be someone. You want to make your parents proud. You want to be the best you that you can be. And so the only way to do that is to stay positive, hang around positive friends, and do positive things. Because if you do things that you know are not good, there's consequences. And we all know what those consequences are. So stay away from that. I mean, smart guys stay away from that. A part of my story you don't know is that I, I, I developed a bad drug addiction. That was a part of my testimony that literally took everything away from me. So this is the, this is, you know, there was the basketball, then there was the school system where I was great, and then there was about four or five years of total debilitation through crack cocaine use and um, got delivered through the word of God. And now God has established me here. So my encouragement would be to the young people is, you're gonna have mountains and valleys, but you have to have a focus. And no matter what you're going through, that's not the end of your story. You know, I've been to jail, I've been to treatment centers, I've been through all these things, and you would've never been able to tell that sitting talking to me here. But, but it wasn't the end of my story. I refused to quit. With my youngsters, in the Bahamas, all I can say is believe that you could accomplish anything and then understand that it's not easy. If you love it, truly love it, and you're truly passionate about it, you're going to put the work in. And if you love it, passionate about it, you will be successful no matter what it is you do. The best advice I ever got was if you do something you love, you will never work a day in your life. When you're involved in sports, you know, it comes down to a very simple fact, is that, is that I, I don't merely want to be considered the best of the best. I want to be the only one who does what I do. I want to be unique, and I want to separate myself from the pack and, and leave footprints. And everybody has the ability to do that. It has to start from the top. The leadership has to now engage the community. And after you engage the community, we can't just talk about it, you have to put it into practice. Because everyone has a solution. Everyone has a solution. But until you engage, test, try, practice, it's not going to happen. It is of the utmost importance that the Bahamian government and the Bahamian educational system make sure that these things are in their curriculum, that they have Bahamian history, that they have uh, uh, a large doses of what the success of their countrymen have been. There's great in all of us. God didn't, nobody's created without, without something good in them, without a purpose. And sometimes we go through all these mountains and valleys. And if I would say anything to the youth, this don't give up where you at. Things look bad right now, there's only one chapter. There's a great book, glory to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's a great book that's been ordained of your life. And this is just a chapter for you to help somebody with later. This is not the end of your story. So I always tell the kids that uh, there are people out there who care about them and want to see them succeed, more so than the ones who don't care about them and don't want to see them succeed. But just to always believe in themselves and believe in their dreams. If they have a dream, you know, just to work for it and believe that they can do it. 
but it's going to take hard work. And don't give up on the dream.